I'd like to welcome everybody to uh, tonight's Bible study. What's that noise? Hey, friend, you're on to you. Sorry. Welcome to Foundational Bible Teachings. So I'd like to welcome everybody to tonight's Bible study. Before we get started, let's pray. Baruch Hata Adonai, Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Noten Veshomer Egvarech, Lelamed Liadrik Hut Lenhot Otanu, Bederek Sheba, Alenu Lelechet, Aledet, Pirat Anenu Zanenu Vilevno, Leman Tim Sorlanu, Merach Matech, Yedi Atra Udvunater, Venireth Niflaot, Mitoratra, Sherwa Hakodesh, Shalachat Tanhet Kolano El Kolahemet, Berechet Limud Hamilash, Elecha Beshem Yeshua. Blessed are you, O Lord, King of the universe, giver and preserver of your word. Teach, instruct, and guide us in the way we should go by opening our eyes, our ears, and our hearts, that you may impart to us of your wisdom, your knowledge, your understanding, that we may behold wondrous things out of your law. May your Holy Spirit guide us into all truth. Bless the study of your word in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. So you finally reached a moment in your life where you finally turn to God. From deep within your soul, you have confessed with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believed in your heart that God raised Him from the dead. And according to God's promise, you are saved from hell, the lake of fire, and of course the wrath to come. Whatever the reason or the circumstances were that led you back to the Lord, you've embarked on a transformative journey of faith where you're going to be cultivating a deep relationship between you and your Creator. He promised in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 5 in the second part of the verse, He had said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. So because of this and the next verse we're going to be reading, you should be cleaving unto the Lord your God. If you look at Isaiah chapter 41 and verse 10, it says, Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee, yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. This should be the first verse that you should be memorizing. It's one of those precious promises that God gives us to heavily lean on and stand on. Fear thou not, for I am with you. Whatever it is that you're going through, He's going to help you to go through it. So never forget, you just started a relationship between you and the Lord your God. Everything you will learn from whatever group, denomination that you're in, things that you're going to learn through people, through books, through articles, through radio, through TV, whatever it is, these should have, underlined should have, the aim to edify and perfect you as a saint as you grow in the Lord. Whatever information is coming to you, no matter in what setting that you're in, it's there for you to grow with the Lord. It's a relationship that you have between you and your God. I've been in groups in the past without realizing it, where there was an invisible legalistic noose that was put around my neck and slowly, slowly they were just tightening that noose. So they used the Bible to basically justify their ways. And as a young believer, not knowing the Bible, I basically took it all in. And as I grew in the Lord, and this is what's going to be happening to you, wherever you might be, you're going to be learning stuff. Take everything in. And at one point, you're going to hear something that's going to contradict something that's already been taught you, that you heard, something that you thought about, whatever it is. What you do at that moment, whatever you have, listen intently to what's being given to you. You compare both. Whatever you're going to be keeping as a belief, in you, in your mind, your heart, your soul, it has to come from the scriptures. It has to be solidly found in the scriptures in its proper context. You cannot take stuff from the Old Testament and jam it down the throat of a believer in the church. You can't do that. You can't take something that was given to the church and jam it down the throat of an Old Testament saint or even somebody that's going to be going through Daniel's 70th week. Once you rightly divide, you're going to know exactly where you are in time. So as I grew in the Lord and I learned to properly read and understand the Bible, I learned who the wolves in sheep's clothing were and basically I would just pick up and I would leave. Now some groups could be intimidating. Don't let that stop you. Get up, get out. If you see there's something wrong, something inside you is not right, get up and get out. It could be the Holy Spirit guiding you says, you know, get up and get out of here because I don't have any idea who these people are. So now you're spiritually baptized the minute you confess with your mouth, believe in your heart that God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. At that particular moment, you're spiritually baptized, you're spiritually circumcised. The Holy Ghost comes in and He indwells you and He seals Himself inside you. Now you are in Christ. Now you are in the body of Christ. You're in His body. So to be in Christ means to have received the gift of the Holy Ghost, which is what I just finished saying, being baptized, spiritually circumcised, the Holy Ghost indwelling in you, and being sealed inside you. This is the gift of the Holy Ghost. And it's a work that God does, not you. I repeat, it's a work that God does, not you. Once you receive 
Once the Holy Spirit comes inside you, He will not unseal Himself. There's nothing that you can do to lose your salvation. I'm going to cover this probably in another Bible study, Lord willing. Your salvation is based on God's mercy, being justified by God's grace. Nothing that you did to merit the salvation, there's nothing you can do to lose the salvation. So again, your salvation is based on God's merit and not on anything that you did. Once you have this in your mind, you're going to notice that a load of bricks is just going to fall off your shoulders. That's what happened to me. It was very legalistic in the first two years of my walk with the Lord. And when I started understanding what grace truly was, I remember that night, preacher had come in explaining all kinds of stuff. We were at it for I don't know how many hours. When they left, I looked at my wife and she looked at me and she goes, do you feel that? I go, yeah, it's like I feel a million pounds light whatever he said it makes sense and plus he was backing it up with scripture which is something that I was starting to get the notion of so what does God say through Paul look at Titus chapter 3 and verse 5 not of works of righteousness which we have done but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior that being justified by his grace I repeat that justified by his grace so there's nothing that we did to get into the body of Christ the only thing that we did was believe in our hearts that God raised Jesus Christ from the dead and this is what placed us into the body of Christ it's an operation that God does so we're justified by his grace once you understand what grace is there you're going to start understanding the thrust of Paul's message to the believers. So when you read the words in Christ, quote unquote, in the Bible, it's speaking to the believers in the body of Christ. Here's an example. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Those three operations, being baptized, being circumcised, being indwelt and sealed with the Holy Spirit. This is something that makes you a new creature on the inside. Sin is still in your flesh. I'm going to be covering this probably in another Bible study. So here are the operations that basically are done in you after your heart confessed Jesus Christ. So go to 1 Corinthians 12, 13. For by one spirit... We are all baptized into one body. This is not water baptism. Many people read the word baptism and they automatically attach water to it. This is a spiritual baptism that the Holy Ghost does. Whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, have been all made to drink in one spirit. So we just saw the first operation of baptism. It's the Holy Spirit that does that. Look at Colossians chapter 2, start reading in verse 11. This operation is dealing with circumcision. In whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein ye also are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God. Did you see that? Who hath raised him from the dead. And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened or made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. Sins are in the body. You'll find that in Romans chapter 7 verse 8. It's sins that are in your flesh. He's basically cut that off. So you're sort of like you've got your soul inside you basically rattling around but we're still in the flesh. Basically what we're fighting after you get saved. I want you to turn to Romans chapter 8 and verse 9. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so be, the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. So for you to be a child of God, you have to have received Jesus Christ. You must have believe, put your faith and trust in the death, burial, and resurrection. You have to understand that Romans 10.9 is the heart of what Paul was trying to say. If you read 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the resurrection is the heart of Christianity, of the believer's hope. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and His righteousness. When He died, He was buried, and He was resurrected. That is the heart of what we're standing on. The minute you take the resurrection out, forget it. We're all fried. And Paul says, if the resurrection never happened, we of all all men are most miserable because our highest hope is built on that. So besides the Holy Spirit indwelling you, 
what else happens? In Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 30, it says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. So I just gave you the baptism, the spiritual circumcision, the indwelling of the Spirit. Now, there's other verses. I just want to make this short. And you've got the sealing. If you want another verse for the sealing of the Holy Spirit, you'll find that in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 13. First you hear, then you believe, then you're sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Now, this is an operation that God does. And please read my lips, not you. There's nothing that you can do for you to do this operation on yourself. It is an operation that God does. And your works do not have any bearing on these four operations that are actually done on you. So there's no work that you did to actually merit the salvation. There's no work that you can perform to undo this operation because the believer in Christ is saved by grace and not anything that you've done. I just hope I'm making myself clear on this point. So we're going to see this principle in Ephesians chapter 2. We'll start reading in verse 8. For by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Christmas is around the corner. You're going to be receiving a gift. Are you going to be putting your hand in your pocket and says, Oh, that's worth about 50 bucks. Oh, that's 75 bucks. The minute you, and they take the money, it's not a gift anymore. You actually worked for it. Look at verse 9. Not of works, lest any man should boast. In a biblical context, grace refers to the unmerited favor and kindness of God extended to humanity. It's a divine attribute that reflects God's love, His mercy, and His willingness to bless and forgive despite human shortcomings and sin. That's what grace is. Now you've just prayed, and now you're putting your complete trust in a death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now what? What's the next step? Now you embark on your spiritual journey, and there's a few foundational aspects for you to establish your growth in the Lord. As a baby comes into the world, it's very limited in what they can do. They eat, sleep, and cry if they want something. It's going to be the same thing for you as a new babe in Christ. As you start walking with the Lord, start establishing good habits. When I came to Lord, I knew absolutely nothing. The only thing I can do was pray, read my Bible, and ask a million and six questions. The answers are there. You just have to go looking for them. These are going to become your three foundational pillars for your spiritual growth. Praying, reading, and asking questions. How many times would I be reading my Bible, I would be home alone, and I'm there, Lord, I don't understand this. Can you please explain this to me? And believe it or not, the answers would come. Sometimes not immediately, but in the vicinity of that time period, you are going to get your answers. So if you're in a place or group and you don't feel free to ask any questions, get up and get out. The reason I'm saying this because I've been in places, I've spoken to people, I asked the question once, they gave you the answer, don't come back and re-ask the same question because now they're going to look down on you. So you're going to have so many questions and ask them all until you get satisfactory answers. The Word of God will supply suitable nourishment for every stage of your personal growth. As a babe in Christ, you'll need milk. This is the natural course of your growth. As a baby needs physical milk for physical growth, so will you need spiritual milk for your spiritual growth in the Lord. And this is the initial step. What does Peter say? In his first letter, second chapter, second verse, as newborn babes, that means you just got saved, desire the sincere milk of the word that he may grow thereby. So Peter is telling you what you need for you to start growing in the Lord. Now notice the consistency of that food. It's a liquid for ease of swallowing at first and as a baby grows so will the food that it will ingest transition into more solid forms of food so similarly as you will grow and mature in the Lord the sincere milk of the word becomes a foundation for deeper more complex truths contributing to your spiritual growth and understanding this meat quote unquote will provide a varied and nourishing biblical diet essential for your overall knowledge and understanding such as yourself God Jesus Christ your flesh, the God of this world, the God to come, etc. These are all things that you're going to be getting from the scriptures. The expression used by the Apostle Peter in 1 Peter 2.2 is to convey the idea of spiritual nourishment and growth. As you come to the Lord, like me, this is what I knew when I came to the Lord. And a baby, when it comes into the world, it's got no teeth, it's got an esophagus about this big. What do you think can go in there? Just a little bit of liquid, and then as it grows, it gets stronger, then it can start taking more solid food. So here's a breakdown of the components of 1 Peter 2.2. 2. Newborn babes. The metaphor of a newborn babe refers to new believers or individuals who have recently embraced the faith of Jesus Christ. And like an infant, you are in the very early stages of your spiritual 
spiritual journey, thus you're a babe in Christ. Desire. The exhortation to quote-unquote desire the sincere milk implies an active and intentional seeking after spiritual nourishment. That means getting yourself on that book and not letting go. So seeking after spiritual nourishment, that is, desiring to know more of God and everything connected to God and whatever you want to know is found in the scriptures. Now please note, this desire, quote unquote, it can be faked. It is, as I've already witnessed it, it can only last a little while. Thus, those who eventually leave never truly got saved. The hunger to want to get to know God is not there. You can fake it at the beginning. Speaking for myself, after 38 years of walking with the Lord, my God, I still can't get enough of the Word. I just want to keep learning. There's so much to learn in that book. It's just incredible. You're going to notice that that hunger to want to get to know God more, it's just going to come from inside. The Holy Spirit is there and it's sort of like fanning that fire in a sense of learn more. Go to 1 John chapter 2 and verse 19. Watch carefully what he says. They, supposedly saved people, went out from us, but they, these people, were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have no doubt have continued with us. But they went out, that means they left us, they left the group, that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. You might be in a church, 500, 1,000, 10,000, 20,000. It doesn't mean that they're all saved. Many people come and go. You're going to know the people that are truly saved. You're going to notice on the countenance of their faces. You're going to see the way they talk, the way they act and react, the way they wheel and deal. You're going to notice that there's something about them, and this is the Holy Spirit in them, just oozing from them. Now, this desire to get to know God naturally comes only to those that are truly born again. There's people they want to know a little bit about God, and then after that, it's okay, I got enough of my fill. There's people that I've heard after 75 years, these people are in their 90s, they cannot get enough. I couldn't understand that. Now I'm understanding where these guys were coming from and I'm going a ways back for myself. So this desire encourages believers to have a true hunger and thirst for God's Word, indicating an eagerness to learn and grow in their understanding of the faith that they have in God. Now, the sincere milk of the Word. The sincere milk, quote-unquote, symbolizes the foundational and essential teachings of the Word of God, particularly focusing on the basics of biblical faith. And this is your starting point. So the term sincere, quote-unquote, emphasizes a pure and unmixed doctrine, genuineness, and the absence of impurities or distortions in the knowledge of God. It suggests an unadulterated and truthful source of spiritual nourishment. So Peter continues to say where to get this unadulterated, truthful source of spiritual nourishment. Desire the sincere milk of the Word. So your source of truth will be found in the Word that God promised that He would preserve forever. Psalm chapter 12 and verse 6. The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purify seven times. Thou shalt keep them. O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Anybody that says that we do not have the Word of God today, or we have some semblance of the Word of God, they're a bunch of liars. Why do I say that? Because God is not a man that He should lie. And if He said that He was going to preserve His Word from this generation forever, I believe God more than these putzes that are basically out there. Having said this now, everything that you will eventually believe, make sure that you will be able to back it up with Scripture. You will notice that if you've watched a few videos on this particular channel, I try to back everything up with Scripture so you understand exactly what's happening when and for who it's for. So I'm trying to give it to you in its proper context. There's a series that I did a little while back, about a year ago, what to believe and where to get it from. If you have an opportunity, go through that series and listen to some of the things, some of the points that I actually said, and you're going to start understanding where you should be getting your belief system from. So thus, the sincere milk of the Word signifies the easy doctrines or teachings to understand from Scripture. Again, this is the beginning of your journey with the Lord your God. The next part of the verse in 1 Peter 2, 2 says that he may grow thereby. The purpose of desiring the sincere milk of the Word is for spiritual growth. By partaking of the foundational teachings and truths of Scripture, you will mature in your faith, develop a deeper understanding of God's will, and become 
more Christ-like in character. And this is something that's done on a daily basis. Some people get it quicker, faster. Some people it takes a little bit more time. Don't look at the guy next to you. It's a relationship between you and your God and say, hey Lord, please help me become a better person in this world for you. That if anybody sees me, I want to make sure that I'm reflecting you. And God's going to take you at the level that you're at and he'll make you better and better a little bit every day. So in essence, Peter is encouraging you believers to engage with the fundamental truths of your biblical faith. Just as infants eagerly desire and consume the nourishing milk that fosters their physical growth, the sincere milk of the Word represents the essential teachings that lay the groundwork for spiritual development and maturity in your spiritual journey. You just started. When the baby is up at about six, eight, nine months, they start crawling. When they're about a year, 13, 14, 15 months, they start standing, they start walking, they start running, maybe at around 18 months, maybe two years old. They're stages. And you coming to the Lord, it's a stage. There's so much to learn in this book. It is incredible. You take it from where you're at and you take it one step at a time. Don't precipitate yourself to take three steps in one shot, you are going to fall flat on your face. I've done it so many times in the past until I learned it's one step at a time. Let me understand it. Okay, Suivant next, give me my next teaching. So the figurative idea of milk here is likened to a child who just started their academic education. They begin with the easy stuff and move on to more complicated stuff, so it seems, until they get there, until someone shows them what it is because nobody is born knowing it all. So in kindergarten, this is where you learn colors, shapes, putting puzzles together, handling scissors, holding using crayons, pencils, pencils, pens, whatever it is, correctly. First grade, you're learning to count, simple math. You're learning the alphabet. You're learning to read one, two syllable words. You're doing simple arithmetic and so on. The more you practice what's being given to you now, the next block of information will be easier for you to assimilate. How many people are getting so much information, they're more lost than a goose in a snowstorm? This is what you look like. I've been there. I was swallowing so much, I was just drowning in it. At one point, not understanding the information coming in. When you're training for the Olympics, for whatever sport. Are they giving you like the big weights? Of course not. You're starting off with 5, 10 pounds and by the time you're finished, now you're up at about 150, 200, 300 pounds curling, whatever it is that you got to be doing. You're going to be adding to the previous blocks of knowledge, just increasing and expanding the knowledge that you have. So you don't teach calculus to a first grader. As time goes on and you keep ingesting the Word of God, you will have grown to a point where you'll need more solid food, meaning getting more doctrinal teachings. The more you walk with the Lord, the more you will start ingesting meatier parts of scriptures. Like for example, the imputation of righteousness, standing in state of man, spiritual circumcision, the eternal security, the Trinity, the deities of Jesus Christ and the Holy Ghost, the dispensations or God's administrations to man, etc. There are so many things that are heavier. You're not going to teach that to somebody that just got saved. They're not there yet. They don't need to learn that yet. They need to know that the foundation, like Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, I have laid the foundation, which is Jesus Christ. Take heed how you're going to build on it. So the foundation is Jesus Christ. Once you know who the foundation is, who truly Jesus Christ is, now you can go forward. Who was Jesus Christ? He was just a man. He was God in the flesh. Oh no, he was uh, Michael the Archangel. Jesus Christ was a prophet. Oh, he was Satan's brother. Wow! I just got saved. I'm being hit with all this stuff. Who is Jesus Christ? You better make sure that you're able to actually back it up with Scripture. Truth is exclusive. You could only have one truth. So one is right, the rest are all wrong. It's your homework to go out there now and figure out who is the real Jesus Christ. So like I was saying, you don't teach calculus to a first grader. Everything has its time. Now back to the milk. Every person that truly was and is born again, their appetite for God and His Word will be insatiable. The one thing that I wanted to do when I got saved was read the Bible unceasingly. I wanted to learn constantly. This is something that I had then and I still have it today. Those who are saved will testify what I'm saying. This is one of the traits that I actually look for when somebody says I'm saved or I'm born again. If I see that there's not a hunger for the Word, if I see that you commit a sin and you're not really repented of it or ah, it doesn't matter, God's going to forgive me. Oh boy, that's the wrong attitude. There's a good chance you're not saved. You think you're saved but you're not saved. You could only fake it up to a certain point. As you grow and 
and mature in the Lord, your sustenance will change from milk to a more solid spiritual food like bread. God's Word is also bread. So turn with me now to John 6.35. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. What else does Jesus say? Go to Matthew chapter 4 and verse 4. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. So both these breads in Matthew 4.4 4 sustain life in their capacity. Jesus said both are needed. To eat the first bread mentioned is only good enough for the body, and it has to be supplemented with the words that God spoke to man for you to have a complete diet. So together, this sustenance keeps man healthy and alive physically and spiritually. The first bread is from the earth, earthy, and it's limited to it. The life it sustains is temporary and it's only good for the body. The second bread is from heaven. It's a heavenly sustenance. The life it sustains to all who partake of this bread is spiritual and it's for the soul. The life it sustains is eternal, spiritual. So as I mentioned, as you grow spiritually and you're going to be maturing in the Lord, your sustenance will automatically change from milk, a liquid, to basically ingest simpler doctrines of scripture, to a more solid spiritual food like bread, which is the deeper doctrines of scripture. So these are believers who have walked in the Lord for the longest time and that they should be in a position to actually teach other people. Instead, they never graduated from kindergarten. Needing those kindergarten quote-unquote instructions, the simpler doctrines of the Bible, to be taught to them again. Now they weren't able to do simple math and this is the same thing for a lot of the believers. They don't study, they don't go check it out themselves and it's also the person in front of you, the preacher, teacher, priest, your minister, your grand poobah, whoever it is that's up there in front, he's not doing a good job transmitting the information from this side of the pulpit to the other side of the pulpit. If this guy doesn't know his elbows from his knees, get up and get out. So the writer of Hebrews actually covers this in Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 12. He says, For when the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk, not of strong meat. So these people could not digest more than the very simpler basic truths. Now why is that? The person that's basically teaching you either will help you or he's going to stunt your growth. So as you begin your walk in the Lord, you're bringing in your worldly carnality. You just got saved, you just came out of the world. The only thing you know is carnality. The Holy Spirit just set Himself inside you. This is where the war starts, between your flesh and the Spirit. So you begin your walk as a carnal believer. You're still saved, but you're walking in carnality. As you grow, you will willingly want to give up your carnality and you will want to walk in a spirit. There's something called sanctification. This is something that will happen to you on a daily basis. All of the filth of the flesh, God will start washing it away from you. He'll make you understand what it is and then you're going to be walking in the ways that the Lord's going to be teaching you. A carnal believer is a babe in Christ. He is not lost. He is walking in his carnality. He looks like the world. He smells like the world but he's not part of the world because he's got the Holy Spirit of God sealed inside him. Now notice what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 1. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. Do you get that? I can't speak to you as a spiritual believer. I'm speaking to you as a carnal believer. You're still saved. And if you keep reading in 1 Corinthians 3, you're going to come to the judgment seat of Christ. And what's going to be judged are going to be your works for the rewards, not for your salvation. That judgment happened 2,000 years ago when Jesus Christ hung on that cross. Verse 2, I have fed you with milk and not with meat. For hitherto, up to now, you were not able to bear it. Neither yet now are ye able. So, what are some of the signs of carnality? For ye are yet carnal, in verse 3. For whereas there is among you, now these are the works of the flesh, envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal? And walk as men lost men. So strong meat represents the weightier doctrines of the Bible. Let's go back to Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 13. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. Now the word unskillful from wordnick.com means to be ignorant of. So somebody who's unskillful in the word, that means you're ignorant of. You don't know what certain things are. 
Verse 14, but strong meat, that means the heavier doctrines of the scriptures, strong meat belongeth to them that are full of age. That means they're mature in the Lord. Even those who by reason of use, reason of use, have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. To mature in the Lord means you have to exercise your senses to discern both good and evil. You have to practice, you have to apply God's word to your daily walk with Him, moving out of your carnality a step at a time. If you can run out of your carnality, that is the best thing that you can do. But if not, you take the days as they come, the Lord will sanctify you, He will cleanse you, He will cleanse your mind. Thus, you're going to be walking in the Spirit. If you never really seriously apply the word of God in your life, if you don't live by the Word of God, the things that He's been teaching you, you will never become mature in the Lord. You'll never be able to take more than milk. Solid food is only reserved for those who have practiced, for those who have exercised, who have applied the Word of God diligently, regularly in their daily lives. So in conclusion, the Word of God will be your spiritual nourishment. So for those of you that don't know the Lord, whatever I've been saying, I just want you to watch this video and this is going to tell you how to get to the first step, which is desiring the sincere milk of the Word. Guys, have yourselves a good week. Lord willing, we'll see each other next week. Amen. Amen. Amen.